recording button. Okay. Right. All yours. Right, let's sort it out. Yes. Let me sort out the technical bits first. Mm, of course. And I'll let other people in as they come along. All right. Right, so hopefully you can see that. Yes, I can. I'm just going to sort out my PowerPoint bit. Don't want that bit. And it says it's recording. Okay. All right. Well, apologies if I, if I have to keep going on mute because I picked up a slight head cold at the weekend, so a sudden attack of coughing. I'll uh, I'll, I'll go on mute for it. But, oh, um, no. We'll see how we go. <laughs> yeah, and I've tried really hard not to make this over technical. Um, I got to seventy five slides, and I thought I've got to pare it back a bit. So, <laughs> so I've tried. I really, really tried to make it non-technical, or at least understandable. And so you're my, uh, you're my audience to be able to give me some feedback if I've achieved that or not. So we'll, uh, we'll see how we go. I can always cut it short a bit if we are getting a bit long. Just, just give me the heads up mm. that uh, it's getting too long. So, uh, so yeah, I think uh, hopefully I've pulled some good information together that will be useful for everyone. I've tried to base it um, for property investors. Um, so it should should be applicable to you know anyone that lives in their own home, um, HMOs and businesses alike. There are a lot of synergies, they say. So so yeah. So let, let's kick it off. Let's see how we go. Um, so yeah, big question. Yeah, is internet the fourth essential service? Yeah, gas, electricity, water, and internet. Yeah, um, definitely um, in HMOs. There's no doubt. I wouldn't have thought he was even in that order, is it? Well, probably above water, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you decide later. <laughs> I'm not going to make that decision. So, so this this is what um, I plan to go through. Um, so um, I'll explain how I replaced the poor internet, this dreadful internet, in one of my HMOs with a manageable, fast, and reliable internet Wi-Fi solution. Explain how you can improve the Wi-Fi in your own home, HMOs or office, so it's a bit of a DIY if you think you're up for that. Oh, uh, and um, I'll educate you a bit on how to get good internet and Wi-Fi. And I appreciate it's a very complex subject and there are lots of, lots of different options. So you know, I've, I've pulled together some basis at least for you to, to work on. And I've got some tools and websites uh, that may be helpful for those that want to educate themselves further or uh, or uh, make their own, own improvements. Okay. So this is one of my high-end HMOs, a bungalow, um, purchased and refurbed in uh, 2018. The large front room was converted into two bedrooms, creating a four-bed HMO. And Incidentally, that, that is now an Article 4 area, which to, much to my delight. Uh, see, so you'll see if I can get laser pointer. I hope you like my, uh, my efficient use of the garage. I couldn't decide what to put in there, whether to convert it into another bedroom. The practicalities, it just didn't work. So we'll put a table, tennis table in there. I'm really delighted about that. It works really well. And... Uh, Fair enough, the subject a bit. The students ab absolutely love that. It's a great selling mm. So, so um, what we can see down at the bottom here is the, this um, This is the main living room. And then we've got one of the bedrooms at the front. So we've got side access here. And the front door's up the, up the side here. Okay. So so this is, this is a floor plan. And the reason I've chosen this HMO is because it's a bungalow. It simplifies things a little more for us. So it's a floor plan showing the room layout. I'll find my, uh, my little laser tool. Um, the size, it's approximately seven meters across the front and it's about 14 meters front to back. So it's 98 square meters. Um, you can see some of the changes we've added in here. Um, 
all, all of these dash lines here, all these are stud walls that we've added to all of these are new stud walls here. We've got stud walls across here. We bricked up a door, well, studded up a door. I put cupboards in every one of my bedrooms. So we've got bedroom one, bedroom two. That's a shower room that can be used by, uh, by the others. It's not just solely for bedroom one. Then we've got bedroom three and four. A porch area here, which is a front door access. This side door is the kitchen access, which isn't really the main incoming and outgoing of the HMO. Right, so, um, so this shows the same plan again. And what I've tried to show here is um, I'm, I'm showing where the um, existing Virgin yeah. Media broadband router has been installed and they always install them at the easiest point for the supplier. So the cable comes from the main road, straight up the path and in the side and then into the cupboard here. So that's where the Wi-Fi is. And um, what it's showing us here, and I've used the color coding as uh, so I've been around doing some testing. We've got a key down at the bottom look here. So mm. we've got good, average, poor, bad. I think really that speaks for itself. <coughs> so um, I've got good Wi-Fi in two rooms, average Wi-Fi in one room, poor Wi-Fi in three rooms, bad to no Wi-Fi in three rooms. So it's not looking that good. It's amazing. Kay. It's so close by, isn't it, that the, the changes? Yes, yes. So th this is how I managed to improve, um, uh, improve the Wi-Fi. Bear me a sec. Uh, just looking for the controls. Um, I kept the existing Virgin Media broadband router up here. Look, I disabled the Wi-Fi. I've installed new data points and ubiquity access points to provide the Wi-Fi coverage that we need to be able to cover the whole area. So now we have great internet access and Wi-Fi in all the rooms. As you can see, we've got good, they're all green, all nicely green. I haven't got any averages, poor or bad Wi-Fi. Now, the way I did this, I, I used ubiquity networks, access points, and a free remote management piece of software provided by Unify. And I'll come, come on to this a little bit more later. You literally find these types of access points. So this is one access point here, look, and this is one over here. You find these installed in businesses, coffee shops, and sports stadiums. So it's pretty serious stuff. So I think really it's, it's a really good, it's a really good solution. And it's cost effective for this HMO property. Was there a question? I didn't get any of that. I'll press on. Um, so, let me answer. So, uh, right. So, I think it's been... important that, that, that you've mentioned that uh, the provider like Virgin would always uh, install it when it's easier for them. And it might be, uh, well, you've got a very, uh, very simple example with, with that layout. But sometimes the uh, front of the building where they would take the cable, uh, it's uh, the worst uh, place to put the, the router. That's it. Because yeah. maybe you've got a bathroom there because it's like a terrace, a commercial conversion, and you've got some, I don't know, bathrooms at the front and quite convenient boiler room or comms room at the back. So if it's before the conversion, it might be a good idea to run the cable for that within the building. Yeah, I can't remember what it's called, the, the, the cable they, they're using, uh, RG6, I think. It might be that mm -hmm. like actual cable. Uh, mm -hmm. I've yeah, done it a few times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would go uh, say through the basement, for example, to, to, to where I want them, uh, to, put the, to put the router and goes to the front wall. That's mm -hmm. where they would put the, the junction box. Because normally they would, yeah. uh, don't know, uh, get into your basement and, uh, and climb uh, 
uh, in, in there to to run the cable. But when Perfect. the builder is, and uh, when everything is open, yeah, you can mm. easily run that cable and leave it for them, and yeah. they're happy to connect it. If the, if the cable is is correct, and it, then you've got the you've got it in the right place then, and it's much easier to take it from from there. Yeah, yeah, good point, Michael. Yeah, okay. All right. Thanks for the break. Stop the coughing. <laughs> um, let's press on. So, so what I've installed, it's called a Unify management system. So it's a business class Wi-Fi. Um, um, so it's the um, uh, single vendor. So we've got the same product range. Can be, it can be bought from different suppliers. Um, security, it's got really good management features. Um, Wi-Fi roaming. Now, when I talk, um, so when I talk about roaming, I mean that a device, if you're on, say, a Zoom call in one of these rooms over here, and you pick your laptop up and walk all the way over to any other part of the building, you'll be able to still continue with your Zoom call. That's quite important, important feature. Some of the equipment doesn't provide that. So it's got centralized remote management access as well. And I've tried to show that here, just on the bottom right hand side. Um, you can get performance stats and have a look at individual statistics anytime you like. So what I can do anytime I like, I can check if the internet's up and working if the, and if the Wi-Fi is okay. I can also check if the Wi-Fi performance and the stats of the users connected are okay. If there's any fault with any one of my HMOs with this equipment installed, I'll get an email. So what I've tried to show over here, I'm not sure if they're going to be too too small for your guys, but these rectangles here. Can, can you read those? I can't. Right. Okay. I tried to keep my slide slide count down. Um, all what these are, uh, you get a mobile app, and this is a screenshot from a mobile app, and this first one here shows all my four installations so i've got four hmos with this equipment installed and you can see the little green dot there so that tells yep. me those little green dots just by opening an app on my phone that the internet and the wi-fi is working at every one of those locations gotcha. this rectangle on the right hand side i'll make them a bit bigger next time is showing me the number of clients connected so i can see how many iPhones, how many some Android phones, or how many PCs are connected at any one time. And it'll also tell me if the connection is good, which I think is a really nice feature. So if you mm. get constantly a, a tenant or a student saying, oh, I'm always getting poor Wi-Fi, if you know what type of phone they've got, you can go on and check and just see what type of performance they're getting there. Okay, let's move on. So, okay, so who am I? Yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> so that's me, <laughs> part of my LinkedIn profile. Um, so from 2016, I became a full-time property investor. I've worked at EMEB, PowerGen, Eon, T-Systems. So I've been a network engineer for 16 years. I've got... Um, Cisco accreditation or had Cisco accreditation. These things expire every three years as a CCMP. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, and I've been a comms engineer for 18 years. Started my days as an apprentice electrician. There we go on the tours. And these are some of the locations I've worked at or worked on. Um, quite a few call centers here, here. Oh no, that's headquarters. That was Eon's headquarters down in Coventry. Um, that is um, Kings Winford Call Centre. Uh, radio sites, I've been up one of these towers. Um, I wouldn't say heights is my thing. Um, another call centre, another call centre. And this place on the right hand side, does anybody recognise it? No. It's one of the power stations, isn't it? Oxford, did <laughs> Ratcliffe on Saw Power Station. <laughs> it, was, it was my last job as a network engineer. 
I was one of the two engineers that replayed the whole of the computer network throughout the whole of the power station. Mm. So we changed out all the outdated Cisco equipment to equipment called Juniper network equipment. Okay. And, oh, I missed the slide. Oh, it jumped on. So we're a bit laggy. Where are we? Yeah. Um, Richard, may I just ask a question? Yeah. How up to date do you keep yourself with um, advancements or changes in technology, different practices, now that you're out of, of the, the, the normal run of things? Well, I've become a full-time property investor since 2016. So that's what my sole focus is on now. Yeah. I just do this for fun now. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Uh, I like to keep up to date with current trends in technology. Yeah, okay. With most things, they do, they do um, always move on in leaps and bounds and uh, try to keep up with everything. So you know, my, my prime focus is property and actually finding finding ways to improve my property journey using IT. It's something I quite enjoy doing. So this, this is my kind of networking. Um, before I became a full-time um, uh, property investor, this was my, my kind of networking, as I just said. Um, I found property networking was a refreshing change from what, what I was used to. So it's been good for me, meeting different people with different views, ideas, and skill sets. So. So yeah, that was a big, big step for me, moving from that networking to property networking. Okay, so I'll let you read that. Is being connected important? That's a very good point you, you make about them not knowing a pre-digital world, Richard. I hadn't really seen it so clearly. Yeah. It's, fr it's frightening, isn't it? Mm. No, but I, I kind of needed to be told it. So, you mm. know, thank you for putting it there almost. Well, I've, I've got a daughter who was born in 93. <clears throat> She's, I remember when, when she was born, we were just transferring over to using um, um, cameras, Cam digital cameras. And yeah. 95, my middle son, he's just now totally digital. In 2001, you know, that both boys live on the internet, yeah, mostly in good ways. Okay. Okay, so four ways we connect to the internet. So there's mobile data, this one here. We've got tethering, which does use mobile data. We've got Wi-Fi, and we've got cable connections. Okay, so mobile data, mobile phones connect to a cell tower in the area instead of connecting to another phone, as you can see here. So a mobile phone connects to a tower, connects to some fancy equipment, and then goes to the internet. So it can fetch and receive data. The voice and data channels of a cell phone are separate. Um, mobile voice goes in one channel, an IP or uh, SMS messages go over uh, mobile internet in another. So the tethering is often used with a PC when there's no local Wi-Fi. So a PC can tether to a mobile phone, typically with a USB cable, as it's showing there, or Bluetooth. Um, so then we come to Wi-Fi, local connection, using residential and business locations, and then you've got your cable, which is dedica dedicated cable connection. Yeah. Okay, so internet providers and Wi-Fi. So this is a copy of the slide we've just seen. So the mobile data is provided by your mobile phone operator. So I'll be talking about these lower two here. So I'll be talking about your Wi-Fi and your cable connections. So when we talk about Wi-Fi and cable, cable is often referred to as Ethernet. It's the same thing. So let's do internet providers first. So here's an example of some internet providers. I think you'll probably recognize some of those pictures there. BT, Virgin Media, Sky, Talk, Talk, they're all the big ones, plus that Vodafone. Not so much now, broadband. John Lewis, they provided broadband. I'll talk about last mile. So 
So who are the fastest ones? That's the question. Who can deliver gigabit broadband? Um, and the fastest options for you now. Um, this mainly will be the full fiber providers, and I'll clarify that in a minute. But Virgin Media is also one of the fastest ones, thanks to their cable broadband technology. So the last mile I mentioned there, we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, this final leg is a big issue. It's something worthwhile being aware of. Right, let's have a look on to the next one. So I'm hoping you can see this in some in a little bit of detail. Can you see that, Sue? I'm having to squint at it, but just about, yes. Okay, well, I'll explain it. So let's start on the bottom. And um, we'll start on this bottom one here. There is a key up here. We've got fiber cable, coax cable, and copper cable. Right. So this bottom one here is your basic broadband from your internet supplier. So we can get up to a speed of 17 megabits per second. This is all your, th this broadband has been around for donkey's years. This is the yeah. bit that you get on your telephone line that comes into the house. So we've got the operators that support it there. So this is what we talk about the last mile. So it's from your telephone exchange to your home. And as you yeah. can see here, we've got a dash blue line, which goes to a street cabinet, which goes dash blue line to a home again. So that dash blue line is copper. Yes. And this bit of copper cable is a very, very old piece of copper cable, which hasn't been maintained very well. And it's going to have limitations. So that's what we... We don't really need to know this fancy name, ADSL2+. Plus. All we need to know is that is the old broadband type service. Still in use today, and BT are looking at upgrading this service. So then we can improve the type of internet service. And they call this FTTC, which is fiber to the cabinet. So we get better speeds on this look here. So then again, we've got a telephone exchange to the home. And what what they, these suppliers have done, they've upgraded the old telephone cable from the telephone exchange to the street cabinet, but they still kept using the old cable to the home. Next one up, we can improve speeds even more. We call this fiber to the cabinet. There we go, Virgin Media, there we go, Virgin Media there. And they've got telephone exchange to the home, street cabinet in the middle, with a green fiber cable, but this time we've got a red dot, and this is a coax cable. This is one of the advantages Virgin Media have, or have had, over BT, in that this, this coax cable is far, far better than this old twisted pair blue cable down here. So now, um, now what they're looking at doing is improving even more, and this top one here, even faster speeds, so up to one gigabits per second, and they're currently fiber to the home. So this is a bee's knees, this is a Rolls Royce. So this is a connection from the telephone exchange to the home, and it's all in fiber. So the standard broadband offering here, it speeds up to 17 megabit. It uses a copper phone line, as I've explained, for the entire journey from the exchange. And it's because of this, the distance becomes a big problem for those living in more remote areas. So if your home is many miles away from the telephone, uh, telephone exchange, you ain't gonna get 17 megabit per second download. So the further away your property is from the telephone exchange, the weaker the broadband signal. Yeah, my and, HMO is about as far as you can get apparently from the exchange, I'm told. Right. The reason for it is a combination of attenuation, the signal getting weaker as it moves further away and the quality of the lines, the electromagnetic background noise, which interferes with the signal. So that the fiber optic cable from Virgin Media, so this one here, they're on fiber to the cabinet lot. So um, yeah, uh, is less prone to attenuation uh, from noise problems, which is why it's much faster because this coax cable is screened, it's protected from that, that interference. Okay. So that gives you a bit of an overview of 
this last mile and the issue all of these providers have. And it's how they provide this service into the home, whether it's on the old copper cable in, which has its limitations. Virgin Media has a coax cable. They did a lot, a lot of cable in many years ago, which is a service I'm on. And then there's this new fiber cable all the way through. So will that be installed, you know, in some kind of rollout to every dwelling, Richard? Do you know what I mean? Are they going to do the whole of Luton or something one day? To produce um, cable <coughs> connection like gas or electric? It will be very much customer driven, I believe. Um, they are able to do rollouts to the street cabs. That, that is something that BT uh, have been doing and I believe are still doing. BT also have um, commitments on making sure the right equipment is in the telephone exchange and they're currently undergoing a telephone exchange upgrade, so they've got the right equipment there. Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> this is an offer that came through to me this morning. If anybody is looking for a broadband service, it might be worth a look. Um, so Sky Broadband, £32 a month. It's actually 35 when I had a look. Um, and you get full fibre, 145 megabits download, 27 up. I think that's the, the service I'm on at the HMO. Right. Yeah. So that, yeah. And we talked about the last mile. So that'd be full, full fibre from the exchange through to the property. No, no, I hmm. don't think so. No. Okay. okay. All right. Not Let me sure. push. Not yes. Sure. Let me push on. Okay. Yeah. Right. So we've done the internet bit. Let's do Wi Fi. So, Wi Fi. It's fundamental to understand what Wi-Fi is um, and that it's a radio signal. The radio signal is going to be affected by its material surroundings, as we can see from here. So what I'm trying to show here, look, this is our transmitter. This is our router or modem, whatever you want to call it. And it's transmitting a radio signal. <clears throat> We've got a barrier here. Now, depending on what that barrier is, we're going to get a signal out the other end to a laptop, your iPad, or your, your mobile phone. So depending on what this barrier is, as we can see, if it's air, we don't get any attenuation. We don't get any absorption. The waves just go through without any problems. If we've got wood, we have um, a low absorption, plastic low, we can move up to here, water medium, plaster medium, bricks, medium to high, ceramic tiles, concrete's high, and metal. So if you can imagine if this barrier is say, um, where's my stud wall? Looking for my stud wall. Oh no, let's go for, yeah, let's go for stud wall. If you've got a stud wall here, this radio wave that's transmitted through here is going to get a low absorption. Okay, if it was a brick wall, it'll be, it'll have a medium absorption to high. If it's concrete, it'll be even higher. So the more attenuation you get, the weaker the signal. So this is referred to as signal strength. So it's important for a device here that it receives a signal of good strength. Okay, so let's go back to our, our drawing, our plan we had earlier. So what do you do if you have poor signal strength? One of the first thing you can do is move the computer. So this example here, this is our um, Virgin Media router with a Wi-Fi. We've got a PC in this room with average Wi-Fi. If they want a be better signal, or it might be dropping out, they could simply pick it up and moving it, move it across. So it's not the most practical. It's easy to move it closer or into another room. Alternatively, you could reposition a little bit for a better line of sight back to the router. If this could be moved to the doorway, it might have a line of sight back to the, uh, to the router there. Or there's another option, you could up, up, upgrade your computer's Wi-Fi antenna with an external one that could be mounted higher. Okay. So 
poor signal strength, another option is, is to find a better place for your wireless router. So you can place your router centrally in your home where possible. This is okay for the older types of broadband, but not very easy to do if you're on Virgin Media or have a fiber optic service, because you ain't gonna be able to move that thing there. Um, you could place your router closer to rooms where the Wi-Fi is the most important. You can move your router up high, such as on a shelf where possible, Height tends to help the signal get over furniture and other obstructions. You can keep your router away from large volumes of water when possible. So water absorbs radio waves, Wi-Fi uses to transmit data. So keep your, your router away things like water heaters and fish tanks. Okay. Okay. Another way to fix signal strength problems is to replace the router. Um, old routers will negatively impact the performance and reliability of your network. Newer routers are more powerful, receive updates that make them more reliable and secure and provide much faster connections. It's a high difficulty level on this one, well, not to be done by the faint hearted. So not all routers can be replaced. Of course, Virgin Media routers would need to have their um, uh, settings put in modem mode. And there's an example of two brand new um, Wi-Fi 6 routers. These are hot off the press, these things. They look like spaceships. There's no prices available for them yet. Another way to fix signal strength problems is to install an extender. These can resolve covered issues to dead area or remote location. So I've tried to show it on here. Um, add in a range extender, so it's a box here and a box into an area which you want to cover on Wi-Fi again. It can create some confusion between devices adding a range extender because it'll half the network speed. So it may overcome initial problem, but it can have um, performance issues on your network. If yet another extender is added, it'll further reduce the network speed. So, okay. I happened to be down B&Q the other day and, and I saw these on the shelf. These are power line extenders, um, similar to as we've just seen there. I mean, they're only 25 pounds here. So what you can do is if you've got a route, if your router's here, you plug, this, you plug this into one of your sockets. The, wire, the internet is sent over your house wiring out of another socket to another unit, and then you can plug your smart TV or device into that. So that'll extend over the power of wiring. Um, it's cheap, so it's an old one. It works, uh, it uses old Wi-Fi. Um, when using these things, it's better not to use 13 amp multi-blocks, you know, those four-way blocks, because it can degrade the performance of them. They're normally fairly easy to set up using a web-based app management tool and the distance between these two devices um, they typically can go up to about 300 meters. Could be ideal if you've got a shed or, or something with power in it that you want to get internet service out there too. Okay, another Wi-Fi extender, b and again. <laughs> 16 pound this one, or oh, we're breaking the bank. This one's slightly different. With this one, it, um, you put it in between the two areas. So this is your existing Wi-Fi area. And if you want to cover an area just outside of it, the idea is you plug this in a socket between and it will boost your Wi-Fi from this area over to here. Operates in a similar way and it's an extender and it will still slow your whole network down, but it might get your way in your remote location. And I think it's the yeah, last one is a, what they call a mesh Wi-Fi extender, fancy name. Um, then again, it's only 29 pounds and you get what you pay for. It's very cheap. Um, the mesh bit 
You can ignore that. It only does mesh if it's connected to the right type of router. And no one's going to have that anyway. Okay. So poor signal strength, mesh systems, real ones. So a mesh system sounds fancy, doesn't it? <laughs> so this is this is a good way to fix signal strength problems is in to install one of these. <clears throat> and they are, and most people can do this um, if you're reasonably competent. Um, they normally come in packs of two or three. You put one near your router and then the other two in various locations of, of your house and they plug into a socket, that's all they do. So, um, it's a set of Wi-Fi access points that broadcast a wireless network all around your home. Normally one unit or node takes the place of your old router, while a second one is located or a third in a nearby room and rebroadcasts the wireless signal so it can reach further than a single transmitter would be able to do. Choosing between buying a standard router or a mesh system, is a mesh system really for you? It really comes down to the size of your house. If you haven't had any signal strength problems, before, then you probably don't need a mesh system. If you have some corners of the home or business where the Wi-Fi seems flaky, then you probably experience signal strength issues, in which case a mesh Wi-Fi system can do a lot of good. So for larger homes, buy mesh. For smaller homes and apartments, stick with an inexpensive router. One of the big things uh, when setting up one of these is where to position each node. So it's these ones here. That one and that one, that one's fixed. You can't really move that one around um, to make sure you've got the right Wi-Fi coverage and you don't get any more dead zones. Um, supports the handoff between the router and satellites. So as I mentioned earlier, this roaming, if you're in one, one side of the building on a Zoom call, and you wanted to walk over to the other side, you'd still keep your call. DIY installation, yeah. The only drawback I can see is they're reliant on 13 amp sockets. I didn't choose this solution for my HMOs because students like unplugging things. Mm. So, okay. So, so and this gets back to the system I, I installed. So this is the unified management system. As mentioned already, it's business class, single vendor, very scalable, you can do what you like, things. Um, good security, uh, Wi-Fi roaming we've spoken about, centralized management, but not for the beginner. Um, unified management system <clears throat> comes with a, a heat map planning tool, as we can see over, over on the right hand side. So if you know the um, dimensions of your business or property, um, you can import the map, scale it, overlay the wall types. So in other words, put on which material has been used for various walls, so brick, stud, any concrete ones like that. Then placement of the access points can be tested. You can add as many as you like and move them around wherever you like here. Within, within your plan to get the right layout. And you can use that as part of your uh, pre-installation. This little uh, app can be downloaded. It's called Wi-Fi Man. It's quite a handy little tool. And um, I use this little app here to help me uh, with my Wi-Fi troubleshooting and testing. Okay, let's go on to Wi-Fi standards. Yes, we have version numbers. Wow, I hear you say. <laughs> I think this is a really good thing. <clears throat> it has been confusing, um, even for the people in the know. Um, the, um, we, used to, we used to rely on knowing if it's 802.11 AC. Yeah, that, that's the latest one. But now they've called it Wi-Fi 5, and they've made it far more clear. So Wi-Fi 6 is the next generation wireless stand, standard. I've not got any Wi-Fi 6 yet. Um, it's uh, fa a lot faster than Wi-Fi 5. Um, uh, the more speed, the more better for performance in congested areas. 
Um, Wi-Fi 6 have officially arrived in late 2019. Um, and the hardware is being rolled out as we speak. So there are some devices out there already. Um, one of the better Wi-Fi's, one I use a lot is Wi-Fi 5, this one here. So it's, we call it 802.11ac. That's a type of um, radio waves or Wi-Fi it uses. Wi-Fi 4 is an older one. And then we've got the really old ones, 802.11g, A and B. I think that's really handy. You know, at least I think my recommendation would be for, as a minimum, go for Wi-Fi 5. If you can, go for Wi-Fi 6. Okay, so I thought this was worthwhile mentioning. Should we use Wi-Fi or should we use a cable? When we say cable, we've got Ethernet, data cable, network cable, UTP, CAT6, it's all the same. It's the same difference, it's cable. So, um, right. so I think one of the big things uh, is um, for Wi-Fi, it has to wait for silence before sending data. I, I like in this, like trying to join an active conversation on Zoom call. You know when two people are talking and they're having a discussion and you want to interject and it, you try and butt in, but it's really difficult because they're talking all the time. Well, that's exactly like wi how Wi-Fi has to operate. A device cannot send a piece of data until there's silence. Another point of it is half duplex. And when I say that, that means that it's very much like a conversation. One device has to talk, the other one stops, and then the other one has to talk when there's the space. So it needs a good radio signal. And one of the bonuses, no fixed location, you can move it around. So cable um, is a dedicated cable. It can talk anytime. It's full duplex, it's a lot, lot faster. You don't get interference on a cable, but it's a fixed location and it's really reliable. So there's a lot of pros for cables. I use cables on all my digital TVs. I wouldn't rely on Wi-Fi for those. Anything that's important that may be streaming or casting, I'll always put a cable to it. Wi-Fi is great for the mobility. Okay. So what happens when the internet fails? Have we been there? <laughs> How does it make you feel? <laughs> what do we do? So what can go wrong? So account issues. Have you paid your bill? How many people have had that? Um, equipment or other fault on an exchange road cabinet. It can affect multiple users and on and multiple users on the street. Um, cable fault, fault in the road, uh, that's a major cable damage can affect multiple users and can take longer to fix. <clears throat> cable fault to the property, often just one site affected. Needs an engineer on site. So it's for Wi-Fi, low power Wi-Fi signal is often found um, on ISP standard routers. They don't provide very good um, Wi-Fi on the routers generally. Wi-Fi router not in the best location, as we've chatted already. Wi-Fi interference from appliances or the Wi-Fi sources. Microwaves, Bluetooth, Xbox, 360 controllers, they all use the same 240 gigahertz radio frequency spectrum. Okay. So potential issues, cable fault, virgin media. So um, these are here's some potential issues. <clears throat> um, I'm sure some, you've seen these types of things. So we've got cover lifting off. And this is a cable into a property. It's lifting off, off and cracked. For much longer, it won't protect the cables and terminations inside. So we've got a cover missing altogether on this one. We can see the coaxial cable and the, and the telephone wires here. They're open to the elements, no protection from physical damage. And this is how it should look. That's a good one. 
That's a bad one. That's a bad one. Right. Um, this was an actual issue at one of my HMOs. It was a cable fault. So <clears throat> the one we, the one I um, showed earlier, in, the, in actual fact. So this is the cable here. Um, well it's the tube that goes into the house. So this is through the, the boundary wall. The coax cable comes out onto the floor and it's broken just, just there. That piece of cable should be connected to this one sticking up here. Um, so uh, on this particular property, I've got uh, Virgin Media broadband support is any time, 24 seven phone service only, 48 uh, resolution, depending on engineer, engineer availability. Four of my student tenants in the middle of lockdown were studying for an exam when the internet went down. I contacted Virgin Media to check what they could remotely and assigned the next available engineer for three days later. It was a bank holiday Monday. The students weren't very happy. I went to site and found the broken cable, as we can see. It's not good. And I fixed it. <clears throat> I cancelled the engineer. The students delighted. The students didn't know why it had broken, but... As you can see from this picture on the right hand side, this is where the cable is. I don't think we can see that very well there. That's where the cable is. It's been fixed there. Oh. Can we do that? Can we do that? Can you see that now? There's the cable. It's been fixed. And this is the corner. They put the bins. So that's why we think the cable managed to get damaged, is to stack the bins up here. The bin men must have come along, spun the bins round, and broke the cable with the bin. A potential issue, BT cable fault. <clears throat> Going back to that um, internet service provider, you remember those really old twisted pair cables, that blue dash cable? Well, this is that cable we're talking about here. And you want to run a really fast and high efficient internet service over this? I don't think so somehow. So as we can see, there's no, no uh, uh, weatherproof covering on these. So we're gonna get water ingress on those. We're gonna get high resistant terminations. And this BT data point, it's called a BTDP, is overloaded, poor maintained. It'll give rise to poor terminations and slow speeds. So the BT, yeah, not good. <laughs> BT overhead cables, last one. How it should look, so this is good. This is what's called a um, pole mount CBT, connectorized block. These, these big boxes up here are the fiber optic uh, terminations. The giveaway is if you read what it says on the, um, on the pole down below, it says caution overhead fiber look here. And it's called, um, yeah your data point and they give them numbers so they can refer to them. There. So this is a good one. It's a good example of a beat. I'm about to finish off on a good one for this. So um, overhead, fiber cables coming up and then they run the fiber cables from these boxes out to the residential or business premises. And this is a good termination for um, an overhead uh, twisted pair, probably a bit smaller. Okay. So tools and useful websites. There we go. Think Broadbrand, thanks to Michael for suggesting this. So it's not just a broadband comparison site, they say. <laughs> um, the, um, it's a good info source from what I can see. I've used it a little bit with guides and forum. Um, get broadband offers if you want to check your broadband um, offers for various locations. You can find your package. You can do some speed tests as well, like I've done here over on the right-hand side. I've just done this from home. We get a download speed and an upload speed. It shows you how fast your speed can be and consistency over that time. You can even set up an availability checker. 
if you want to re monitor remote locations. I tried it, but failed here, which is why it's all red. That should be all green. Um, and the idea is their server polls the remote sites, my home in this case. But um, I found out that I would need to make a change on my router um, to tell my tell my router to respond to it. So I didn't go any further than that. I'm not too sure that's the good thing to do. So good info site, thinkbroadband.com. Best Wi-Fi extenders. If you did want to put yourself a mesh system in, have a play with it, try it out. I came across the Telegraph, um, I think, and they, um, they've got six suggestions from the Telegraph, um, which is definitely worth a look. <clears throat> so that first one, 179.99 from Curry's, yeah, it seems a good mesh network. Um, and then the other one from Curry's is a Netgear Nighthawk. It's £119.99. Very different prices compared to the ones we've seen at b &Q. So you're, you're going to get far better performance out of things than you would say the b &Q ones. So if you're looking for something, definitely worthwhile having a look at that. Um, if you want to learn more, um, Metagi, oh no, where are we? Oh yeah, Broad, oh, Broadband Buyer, okay. Um, Broadband Buyer is a place where I buy my some of my networking equipment from. Um, I've been using them since for a couple of years. Uh, they supply my Ubiquiti and Unify Wi-Fi equipment. I've also bought the same equipment off uh, Amazon. But they're quite a good site. They're quite informative as well. They'll do pre-sale support. Um, they don't supply installation support. So the, these are the units I install here. Access points there. Okay. And um, that, that, those ubiquity points are hardwired by the installer, are they? Yes, they are. Yeah, that's yeah. how you get the really good performance out of them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, MetaGeek is a good site for information and software. Yeah, aimed at the beginner and more experienced. So <clears throat> for, the, for the beginner, if you wanted to go around your house with a laptop and see and check your Wi-Fi signal strength, these guys do, these guys do um, this one here, um, a download. It's called Signify. Um, it's quite good. It's, um, quite, it's quite easy to use and they give you recommendations and they explain what some of the issues could be and how you could probably fix them. They also tell you how easy or hard it is to do it. Um, so it is free. Um, so you download the tool. Um, they also do, as well as the uh, Signify tool, uh, a more advanced tool, Insider, which runs on Windows, which, which I, I use. And that gives me kind of an over, over, overall view of the Wi-Fi and for more details, if I'm having a look at a site. Wi-Fi Man is a little tool um, that I showed earlier. If you want to install a, an app on your phone, that's what it looks like if you're looking at looking for it in the Play Store or App Store. Um, quite easy to use. You can do speed tests, see how fast your uh, internet is or your Wi-Fi is in different rooms. That, that's, a, that's quite good. Um, if you've got a Virgin Media service and you have any issues, Virgin Media will always point you to this location. And it's a speed test again, plenty of speed, speed test tools out around there. Um, and it's called fast.com. That's what Virgin Media rely on when they want to do a speed test. And that's where they'll tell you where to go. Okay. And that's it, my word. Didn't time fly. So, <laughs> is, is internet the fourth essential service for residential and business properties? I'll let you decide, I think. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. It's been very informative. Yeah. Shall I stop the recording? Yep. Can I ask a question, Richard? Far away. Um, what do you, you use... Um, Wi-Fi man to um, uh, 
Uh, I'm not sure what uh, purpose you use uh, Wi-Fi, man, apart from just some sort of quick checks, but what, what do you use to manage all your HMOs with Unify products in? I use Unify's um, mobile app. So I have two apps on my phone. Yeah. The, uni, the Unify one, <clears throat> which gives me the management, and also the Wi-Fi man. The Wi-Fi man is more of a bit of a portable tool that I can use to check signal strength and do speed tests. Okay, so um, so I've got I've got Unify and my HMOs and a couple of other places, but um, I've got the Unify Network app which I think I use to install the Unify products in the houses. I've just downloaded the, sorry, excuse me. <coughs> I've just downloaded Wi-Fi, man. But um, have, I got to, have I got to install controllers? You may need to, that, so that, that'll be for Unify. You may need to in, set up your controllers. Um, depend, uh, it depends. Do you have a, have you got your own controllers on site or do you use someone else's um, uh, uh, on the cloud controller? Uh, no, I don't use anything. I've just right. got the standalone units on site. Okay, you'll need a, you'll need a little controller then. They're uh, little USB controllers and they're about 80, 80 90 pound each. Right. So, and I install one of those on each of the sites, do I? Yeah, normally I normally plug them into my um, uh, in my uh, switch. I put an Ethernet switch out there, yeah. which will provide power to them as well. It's called PoE, yeah. so that will power it. <clears throat> so yeah, I just normally plug them into one of my ports, and then you can use the Unify a free account with that Unify app. Right, okay. All right, thanks for that. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> I think you've lost me on that last one, but um, it's yeah. not important. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, right. Any more questions? Shall I stop the recording? Yep, yeah, I've, got, I've got a question, but I don't know whether you want to record it or not. It's just very personal. Well, if you want to, um, it feels weird talking to a blue screen. <laughs> Um, if you like, we're, we're at a stage now where we've got a, uh, a large HMO, which is going to be 10 bedrooms with license for 15 people. How much infrastructure should we be putting in and at what level, I guess? So what would you recommend if off the bat now, would it be something you need to see or would it be something that you could almost go right? Well, straight away, you need to have a minimum of X, Y, Z. Um, I think there's a few questions. Is um, the pur the purpose of the, the purpose of the building, the type of users, what type of profile you you'd expect they would need? In other words, are they uh, are they just um, ad hoc email and internet users, or are they gamers? Or are they heavy heavy users? Um, also, um, the area you want to cover the area you want to be able to give them the internet or the, wi the, the Wi-Fi? Is it just certain rooms or is it the whole area? And yeah. also the size of the property, that will make a difference as well. The bigger well, it is, the more the data points. I think it's about 240 square metres. And is that right? Yeah, about 240 square metres over three storeys. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be 10 bedrooms with one communal, well, two communal rooms, three communal rooms. Um, so we probably want internet access over all of them. Type of user, 25 to 40. Um, professional user, don't know, I don't know whether they'd be like heavy gamers as such, but I would say internet would definitely be, we'd probably want to overspec it rather than underspec it. We wouldn't want someone coming to us, paying us hopefully good rent and then um, complaining that the internet wasn't, Good enough. We don't want to under under invest in this. If right. it's okay. And you've got solid walls, I expect, Shane, haven't you? <coughs> um, yeah, we have got solid walls. 
Yeah, very what solid, time? I think. Yeah, what time? Concrete or brick? Brick. Brick. Okay, well, that's a bit better. <laughs> brick and plaster. Right, okay. Right. So, Richard, I missed, I missed the very start of your presentation, so apologies for that. So do I take we've got two problems? We've got to get a, a big enough signal into the building, so enough megabits per second or whatever, yeah. Yeah. to be able to divide between 10 people so they can all have reasonable use. Yeah. And then that's got to be distributed to each room, either by Wi-Fi or we could mm. run a, an Ethernet cable, a Cat5 or 6 cable to each room and then have some sort of distribution there as everybody got to plug into the wall if we do that. Can there be sort of individual Wi-Fi broadcasters in each room? Right. OK, so so, yeah, fundamentally, you've got your Internet service provider, you've got Internet provider. You'll need a package from them which will be sufficient to be able to um, provide the download and the upload speeds for all of your users concurrently. Mm -hmm. So that's one part of it. The second part, then, is how you get that Wi-Fi or that Internet by Wi-Fi or cable throughout the building. Now, you might decide that they're all going to be mobile users. <laughs> um, in which case, if they're all going to be used relying on the Wi-Fi, you'll need to provide good signal strength throughout all the areas that you want to provide that in. Bathrooms are very important, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's where most people spend a lot of their time on the, on the internet, but I'm told. Um, so you have to decide, if they're all going to get Wi-Fi, you're going to need to make sure you've got lots of good, strong signal strength, so lots of access points. If you decide that you're going to have a bit of a mix, you're going to rely on Wi-Fi for those people walking around, but you also want to provide some dedicated cables, say for televisions is what I do. Uh, I run a dedicated cable to the television, or if there's a desk where someone's going to be bringing a, a computer and they want to plug in, I'll provide a data point at a desk as well. So it's, it's really how you see those people needing uh, to use the internet are they going to be more mobile or are they going to be fixed is it going to be a mix i suspect more often than not it's a mix yeah and and sorry slightly supplementary question if if, if we've got 10, 10 rooms 10 users at any one time does that mean does your experience say that means we need at least 100 megabits per second or something coming into the building or doesn't it work like that it depends what applications are running, and that can get quite technical. Um, it's a matter of having a look at the packages that are available. And a lot of the packages that are available now are more than, more than good enough to, provi uh, to provide a good internet pipe. You know, so, so long as you don't go at some of the really entry-level um, internet services, like 17 megabit per second, you know, technically that might work. I've, 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 just done a, I've just done a postcode search on the, the actual property and they've given us loads of offers. There's yeah. like 108 megabit, megabits. Um, megabit, yeah. Yeah, megabit. Uh, but no, that's the highest one I've got. Oh, 213. Yeah. Just go with Virgin Business and you can always upgrade it. Go with a like, medium package and they'll be happy to upgrade it if required for you. Once you've got the equipment and the cable on site. Okay, oh, I've got loads. Yeah, as you go yeah. down, there's, there's loads. There's loads more available. Yeah, yeah. Probably at the moment you can't find anything better than Virgin Business as a as a provider if they are available there. Okay. okay. It's it's the city centre, so I think we'll be okay with the provider. It's just getting the arrangement right in the property. Right. It'd be worthwhile considering your mobile aspects then. I mean, you might want some dedicated cables if you're going to have desk locations or TV locations. I think we probably will do that. We'll have one, yeah. one Ethernet cable for the TV and one for where a desk would be where they can plug in a laptop. And then all yeah. the mobile stuff would be for if they've got iPads, phones, walking yeah. around. So, for example, you say 10 rooms? 10 rooms. Three floors. Three yeah. floors, yeah. Okay, so typically what you do is, um, um, as, as I showed earlier, there's a planning tool. Um, we could use, it would be a matter of using the planning tool, import the plans, add the type of walls, and you could play around with where to add the access points. And typically they'll be installed in a corridor. Rather than install them in a bedroom, yeah. which will limit access, they're normally installed in a corridor. Minimum one per floor, so you'd be looking at a minimum of three. 
depending on the um, size of the floor, forget the size you mentioned now, you may be looking at two, three, however many per floor. Okay. Right. And then that will, that may, depending on how big the rooms are, give you your full coverage. Um, and following on from that, you mentioned one system that was not for beginners, and then you went on to the next bit. The one that I'm familiar with is the Ubiquiti. Yeah, that's the uh, not for beginners one. Oh, is that that one? Okay. Yeah. So is, that, is that the, okay, I thought it was on the, the slide previous. Right, I thought you yeah. could say there was maybe one, one up from that. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's, I think if you've got a bit of experience and you kind of used to a bit of IT, it's probably something you could model yourself through with doing. So it's, it's not just to ever take an ownership of, where it's like, right, let's not make a mistake, let's speak to the experts. <laughs> <laughs> it's always been someone else has dealt with it. <laughs> right. Andrew, we've recorded this so that uh, hopefully you will be able to watch from the beginning when we've uh, uploaded it. All right, that's brilliant. Thank you, Sue, fantastic. And I, I left the recording on because I think that the question has, has sort of given flesh to the presentation in that, you know, it, it had Richard problem solving in a real environment, like, you know, like the example bungalow that he gave us as well. Okay, um, good. Uh, Richard, may I just ask a question? Yeah, far away, Rich. I, I've got, um, broadband services supplied by a utility warehouse and we've had that for years and I noticed in your list of broadband um, providers that, that they weren't listed at all. Um, do, do they piggyback on somebody else's um, infrastructure? More often than not they do. Um, I, I just did a, a rough internet search. Um, a lot of the providers providing internet services piggyback on the back of BT. And, uh, and it boils down to BT's network because um, the, um, it's all, all to do with this last mile and something they call unbundling. So all the telephone exchanges used to be solely owned and run by BT. But then all these other providers came along and said, actually, we want a bit of space in your telephone exchange. So that, that's called unbundling. And um, what happened is these providers came along and installed their kit in BT's exchange. So then they can use BT cable, use BT's brick building and the cable to get out to the remote location. So it piggybacks on the back of BT. Okay. Thank you. I, I had a battle recently with Plusnet and um, I'd moved to Sky through having been disgusted with Plusnet. And um, Plusnet tried to tell me that I was on Sky equipment at the exchange. And of course, I didn't, couldn't argue whether I was or not. Because they mm -hmm. say that they think that they're still providing a service. Right. When I had switched to Sky. But, you know, I, I gave up mm -hmm. in the end and we, I got fed up with fighting. <laughs> <laughs> But that may have been a byproduct of your unbundling thing in that I may be on Sky equipment at the exchange because that's my HMO and there is no Virgin in the town. Right, okay. Um, so I have a, a Sky service which is adequate, but one of the things that um, uh, Shane and Andrew said is that they're going to have 10 rooms and therefore 10 connections. But I found I had six or seven connections with just one tenant in that he had his Xbox and he had um, his smart TV and he had um, a sky box in the um, in the kitchen and his own phone and his iPad <laughs> and his laptop. Mm. Um, because he was whinging about low speeds and I told him to turn off some of all that lot and I've not heard from him since. Um, but I think your idea, Shane and Andrew, of having one, one user per, per humanoid is probably a little inadequate and Richard may be able to um, kind of flesh out what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It refers a lot to kind of the 
inter internet of things we're going to have many devices around us either personally owned you know watches not this watch but normally you know watches and uh, so many devices are going to be needed to connect to, to the internet like uh, dishwashers are now I realize I was, we're looking for a dishwasher and I could get it wi-fi enabled I mean well, may maybe that's something I don't need but people are going that way you know they're connecting many devices and I can see it on the management of my HMOs the number of devices they're connecting on there, they're not necessarily using a lot of bandwidth. So they're not really impacting your, your internet service you've got there, but they need that connect connectivity. So we're gonna see more and more of it, I think. Yeah. What the heck is a, is a web enabled dishwasher? Oh, you you dishwasher? Well, you, you can set it to come on when you sat down and watching TV. <laughs> It's a little bit like the internet enabled kettle. Well, somebody's still got to get up and fill it. You now, what's the use that you can switch it on when you start watching the TV? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, PowerPoint was a little bit complicated, but so there's a lot of content there. So I, I hope you managed to get something out of it at least. I think you you broke it into very manageable pieces. I, Good. I, Completely agree with that. Well, slightly lost at one point, but only once. <laughs> I was trying to avoid the glazed eyes. <laughs> and I could see people getting a bit glazed and we'll move on a bit. <laughs> oh, thank you very much for putting the time together to put it, you know, to... Uh, um, yeah, I'm sure you've run through it several times in order to de-flee it because you were going on too much, so... You put yeah. a lot of time yeah. in and we appreciate it. Thank That's you. That's okay. All right. If, if you do have any questions or you need a bit of guidance, give me a shout and I'll I'll try and point you in the right direction I can. Sure. Okay. <laughs> right. are, you sure, are you sure you want to make that offer? Well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop the recording. Yeah.